Hello everyone. In this lecture, I will be talking about control flow in Python. So namely, um, how do you do if statements and different loops in Python? And I'll also cover um, some very neat functions that Python offers to make these uh, loops um, a little easier to work with. Okay, so we start with ifs. And here we have a very simple if statement uh, where we just check if one plus one plus one is equal to two. And if it's true, we will print true and else, otherwise we will print false. Here it's very important that you um, have indentation in your um, blocks. So in the if block and the else block, you need to indent your code by either a couple of spaces or a tab and make sure that you also uh, are consistent with using tabs or spaces and the number of spaces that you indent. Python can sometimes get a little confused if you mix these up and you'll get some indentation errors. And um, if you get them, try to um, convert all of the spaces to tabs or all of the tabs to spaces and just make sure that um, everything is um, yeah, consistent all over the code. All right, and uh, furthermore, the if statement in Python will not need parentheses, but it's just an if with a sp uh, after that a space and then the expression you want to evaluate, followed by a colon. And that's the whole if line, um, basically the head of this if statement, uh, which will evaluate um, to a boolean, and then it will figure out which part of the if it will execute. Um, if the first part was true, it will of course uh, execute the first part, and else, if that part was not true, it will execute the second part of the if. We can also leave out this else um, so that we just have the top part of the if and that would also work. So if we execute this, um, it prints true because 1 plus 1 is indeed 2. Okay, now a couple of words on uh, testing if some object is true. In Python, um, different objects evaluate to false and others evaluate to true. And you don't um, only check booleans but you can also check um, basically any other object type um, for its boolean value. And there are a couple of rules of how Python checks if something is true or false. And firstly, we have a list here of uh, what um, by default will evaluate to false. Um, these are none, so the uh, object equivalent of null in C++ and Java, for example, which is just, an, uh, is just a value of specifying um, emptiness or the lack of an object, uh, the lack of an value. And um, yeah, this will evaluate to false. Then false will of course be false. Um, the zero for numer numeric types, so for integers and floats, zero uh, will be false as well. Then empty sequences or collections will also be false. So here we have an empty string, empty tuple, an empty list, empty dictionary, and an empty set. These will all be false, uh, uh, interpreted as false by Python. And then the objects that you um, made from, from your own classes, um, they will be false if um, this class implements the len function and it returns zero. So if len of an object is zero, then the object itself will be interpreted as, as false by Python. All right, and here we have uh, an example. Um, here are just uh, concatenated all these um, options that I listed up here with ORs, and uh, since all of these should evaluate to false, when um, yeah, concatenating them with an OR, a logical OR, the whole thing should still be false. Um, so this uh, else block should be executed, and it should print all of these are interpreted as false. And yeah, it does. And uh, there's also this bool function, and to the bool function you can pass an object, and it will return uh, either true or false, whether um, Python interprets this object as true or false. And if we convert, for example, one to um, a list with a string inside, um, or just a string with some letters inside, so a non-empty string, uh, these will all evaluate to true. Um, but be careful with that, because um, if we, for example, test um, if something is true by saying something is equal to true, then this is not always true, even though the bool function would return true. So for example, for one, um, it is true. I can just execute this. Um, so for the top part here, you can see all of them are true. But uh, if we use the equals true, 
then only one equals true is true and the others are false and uh, this could lead to some mistakes if you for example have an if statement and there you would want to ask if two is true for example and you want to do something if two or if a value if a variable uh, evaluates the true and the variable has the value two then um, it should execute the if block but if you say if two equals equals true then it will not be actually true because this will evaluate to false as you can see here this is the case because um, the bool class in python is actually a subclass of the integer class in python um, with true being a one and uh, false being a zero and as you can see here one does indeed uh, equal true and uh, python will internally see true as a one so this evaluates to one equals one which is true but the second part here um, would then be two equals one and this is false for python so be careful with that uh, i can show you here this is inst uh, is instance function it will take two arguments an object in a class and it will check all, uh, if um, the object is um, an object of this certain class and here this is actually true uh, true is an object of the of the type int and uh, yeah i think this is very important because this might lead to some mistakes but if you uh, use an if statement and you just write um, a value in there without the equals equals true or equals equals false then it will use the bool function to determine the truth value and um, as you see in this if statement here uh, it will say all of these are true and uh, here we asked if two and uh, this list with the cow inside and the string false um, are true so if all of these are true since they're concatenated with an end it will print the first uh, part here and if not it will um, execute the second part here so if you just write uh, the value in an if statement it will use the bool function and uh, not actually the equals equals true all right then um, one feature python has is also conditional assignment and here uh, we can in one line check if um, a variable has a certain value and if it has the value then we can um, just we can assign it but if it does not have um, a certain value then we can assign something else and um, for that we can also use the or and uh, the or will take the first part um, of this or statement um, if the first part is true and if the first part is true uh, if the first part is false on the other hand it will take the second part and sign that so here we uh, have an array and it's an empty list and then we say array or error which is a new variable equals array or the string the array is empty and since array in this uh, case is an empty list it will evaluate to false meaning that um, this or statement will actually take the string and assign the string to this variable so if we execute this we get the string the array is empty because uh, python figured out that array is false since it's an empty list and empty lists um, are treated as false then it takes the second part of this or all right and um, java and c++ have switch case have these switch case um, statements but python does not have that um, a switch case would be basically an if with a lot of cases so you don't have to write if something is true um, else then another if something is true and then a whole list of that but the switch case can uh, eliminate that and do a very neat um, way of checking for multiple values um, python does not have that directly but it has this elif and um, elif is basically short for else if and we can just use it in a normal if we start with a normal if and check a value and um, if the first uh, part of the if if the normal if here didn't evaluate to true then we'll go to the second one um, which is the else part and then we'll execute the second if so it will check the second one if that was true it will execute this and stop but if this was not true it's going to go it's going to go to the third one and check this one until it finally reaches the else um, or no more options available so um, here we have the command append 
and we'll check for pop, push, and top. And if none of these, um, if command was none of these options, then we will print no valid options. So yeah, append is not in this um, if statement. So it goes into the else part and says no valid option. All right, um, Python also has ternary expressions, which are also present in, um, in Java, for example, which is basically an if statement in one line. Um, yeah, and here uh, we have quite a complicated example where we first define a number equals one, and then we print this uh, little convoluted string, um, which generates um, the sentence. There is um, then the number grams uh, in a kilo kilogram. But if uh, this number is one, we of course want there is. If the number is more than one, we want there are. And uh, this ternary expression can deal with that. And I will explain it with a simple uh, example down here. But first I want to show you that this um, is indeed powerful because we can execute this. And uh, if the number is one, it says there's one gram in a kilogram. If we, for example, change that to three, it will say there are three grams in a kilogram. So we change the, um, the string itself by just changing the number. Uh, yeah. And we also switched uh, to a by down here instead of hello for one. And yeah, so how this works is, if I go back to one um, with the simple example down here, um, it will take the first part here, so the hello, if the number is equal to one. And this, you can basically read this as an English sentence. Um, use hello if the number is one, else use by. And this is basically how the ternary expression works. Um, and if the number is one here, it will use hello. If I change that to three, it will use by. Because this is now false, it's go, uh, it's, it goes to the else part and uses the by. And uh, here we don't have to indent anything or use new lines and there's no colon. We just write uh, basically this English sentence down. Okay, now coming to loops. First we'll cover the while loop. Um, while loop, yeah, pretty um, simple I guess, also present in basically every programming language. It's just um, a loop uh, which runs until some stop, uh, while until some uh, condition is not satisfied anymore. And in this example we first define a string input which is empty and then we say um, while not input dot is numeric uh, we do something. And this while not um, and then is numeric we just check um, if um, the is numeric returns false and um, as long as this is numeric um, returns false, it will keep running this loop. And I guess this is still pretty easy to read because it's a lot of English words. And um, yeah, it's, I guess, pretty similar to an if, but it's not going to do everything once, but as long as something happens. Um, so the syntax is also very similar. Instead of an if, we have a while here, um, then also no parentheses, and a colon in the end, and then we have to indent uh, this block as well. So if we run this, um, this input function just uh, requests some user input and displays this string here um, as a request. If we execute this, it asks for a number. Um, if we don't write a number, it will ask again because this input that is numeric um, is false. And as long as this is false, the while loop will run. But if we write a number, it will stop. All right. Um, yeah, Python does not have any do while loops as other languages you might know, but we can emulate the do while um, behavior using a normal while loop. And um, here we create an infinite loop using while true. And while true will always continue to run um, because true will never evaluate to false. So while true is infinite. An infinite loop. Um, but now we have this break keyword and break will actually stop this infinite loop. So it's not really infinite but it just um, would run infinitely if we didn't have the break. And this um, piece of code does the same as the one above. It um, asks for user input then checks if the input is numeric. 
if the input is numeric, we'll break. So we'll go outside of this loop. And um, yeah, if this doesn't uh, evaluate to true, then it will not execute the break and it just uh, go back to the start of the loop. So if we execute um, using um, just normal um, non-numeric strings, it will uh, keep asking for a number. But then if we enter a number, it stops. Okay. Now we come to um, iterators and for loops. And for loops in Python work differently than in uh, Java or C++, for example. Whereas, uh, and the, the different the difference is that um, for loops in Java and C++ use uh, indices. So you have to define an index and um, a step size and an ending condition. Whereas in Python, you have a for loop uh, which iterates over some collection or some iterator. And uh, these iterators are very powerful in Python. And um, yeah, we'll go into how you create them and uh, what you can do with them in the next week. But here, um, I will show you some examples of that already and uh, how you can write basic for loops. So here, for example, uh, which is basically for each loop, um, we have a simple for loop which goes over this list. The list is 1, 2, 3, 4. And uh, the syntax for this is for i. So we have the for keyword for, to define a for loop. Then i says this is our variable, which will get a value from this, um, from this list. And then in, uh, which says now um, we have the collection uh, from which you should take the, the elements. And then the collection itself. So this could also be a number, uh, not a number, a variable. Um, and this, if this variable is an iterable, then we can also run the for loop over it. And yeah, again, we need this colon. And this colon in Python basically just means that uh, we start a new block here and uh, we will have an indent indentation. And then in this example, we'll just print the i. So the i will iteratively get a value from this list and it will start with the first one and go on to the last one. If we print, we get one, two, three, four, as expected. Now, this doesn't have to be a list, but we can also use a string, for example. So we can iterate over the characters of the string and print the single char uh, characters of the string string. Um, and as you can already see, this seems to be very powerful because we can just iterate over different objects and the way how we iterate is defined inside the object. So we could also um, use an, an own object here from, an, from a class that we define ourselves, uh, which, iter uh, which implements um, the special iterator function. And then we could also just use this for loop with an uh, own object. And uh, this iterator function has a special name in Python. In Python. It's this double underscore iter, double underscore function. And you can check if some object has this function using the has attribute function in Python. This is predefined. Um, so you can just use it without importing anything or something else. Um, and it takes two arguments. First, the object uh, for which you want to check the attribute, and then the attribute itself as a string. And um, I guess you just have to remember this double underscore iter, double underscore. Um, this is the attribute which um, defines how something uh, becomes an iterator in uh, Python. And uh, yeah, in this case, attribute does not mean it's uh, a variable, but it can also be a function. So in this case, iter is a function, um, and attribute just means it's some part of the object. So either a member variable or a function or a method. So if we check for the string, if the string implements the, uh, the attribute iter, uh, it returns true. And as we saw above here, we can use the string in the for loop, which already suggested that we can use this iter function. And Python will use that internally to create this iterable. Um, yeah, the for loop will internally create the iterable using the iter function, but we can also do that manually using this iter function without under, uh, underscores. And this um, is just a built-in function into Python um, that will take any collection or any iterable that implements this iter function, this double underscore iter function, 
and then it returns this iterator object. And iterators are special objects in Python, um, yeah, which we'll uh, cover next week. So if we execute this, um, the type uh, function will tell us that uh, this is a list iterator and uh, this address, uh, you don't have to uh, know what this means. It's just the address where this object is stored in computer memory. Um, it's not really human readable, so you don't have to worry about this. And then uh, this next function that we call and pass this iterator returned one in this case. And next just returns um, always the next object that comes in the iterator. And the iterator here got the list one, two, three, four, five. So um, the next element, if we haven't started yet, is of course the first one, which is one. All right, so now I guess you can um, ask yourself, what will this loop then do? Um, we create a for loop and iterate over the x. x was defined here and we've already called this next on x once. So um, we have already got, we already, already retrieved this one from the iterator. And now we use the x in this loop. Um, and I'll execute this so you can see that it doesn't show the one again because the iterator state, um, the internal state of the iterator knows that one was already retrieved and we're now at the two. So we will start with two. And yeah, if we try to uh, use next again, after um, using up all the elements in the iterator, we'll get an error. Uh, it's a stop iteration. And um, these for loops will actually um, iterate over an iterator until they reach this stop iteration. So here this for loop uses up um, all the elements in the iterator. And after, you, after that, we can't uh, call this next anymore because this will give you an error. All right, and um, now a little exercise. Here we define um, another iterator, uh, we call it x, and um, it gets past the list 0, 1, 2, 3. And then we print um, list and pass um, this x iterator. List will convert um, anything to a list. Um, this is the um, like basically constructor function for a list, and you can pass an iterable or an iterator to this list and um, yeah, this will create a list out of that. And if we print this, we indeed get the list uh, 0, 1, 2, 3, which was defined inside this iterator up here. Now the question is, what will this print? Uh, the sum function will take some iterable and um, iterate over it and add together all the elements. So you'll have a question now. Okay, and the result is 0. Uh, why is the result zero? Because this list function used this iterator and it actually used it up. So there are no more uh, elements inside this iterator because list took all of them and then um, until the stop iteration and then uh, the iterator was empty. So when we got here, x was already an empty iterator. So sum had nothing to do and the empty sum is zero. So yeah, the sum of this empty iterator x is zero. All right, now we'll come to the range function. Range is um, very commonly used to get the functionality of a normal index style for loop. Range is um, a function that will return a generator. And you also don't uh, have to know about generators yet. We'll also cover that in the next week. Um, but range will um, create basically an iterator and, uh, which goes up to a certain number that you specified. And if you just pass one number to range, it will start at, the, at zero and go up to um, the number you passed minus one. So this is again exclusive, um, just as the slicing was in, uh, in lists. And uh, range is very uh, handy if you want to generate these index lists or index generators. And yeah, if we execute this, um, we first have range um, up to six and pass that into the list function and print that. And list, as I said earlier, converts an iterator into a list. And here we can see that range gave us uh, zero, one, two, three, four, five, um, as expected because it starts at zero 
and goes up to this limit minus one. And uh, yeah, range returns a special um, object of the class range, as you can see here. Um, and this range object is a generator. Uh, yeah, this concept will um, be covered in next week. Okay, and here's an example for how we can use range in a for loop. And it's very simple um, to do these um, Java or C++ style for loops. Um, we just use the normal Python syntax for a for loop, but instead of writing some uh, collection here, you just say range and then up to which number you want to go. So this will go from zero to five and print all the indices in between. Um, yeah, this empty print will just print a new line so that you can um, see where the new print st uh, will start. And then in the next example here, this range will, um, will start at two. So here we pass two arguments. And if we pass two arguments to, to the range function, the first one will be the start, the starting index, and the last one will be, um, again, the exclusive stop index. And this is also very similar to the slicing uh, notation that we saw earlier. And it basically works in the same way, but in the, uh, now this time it will generate us the indices. And we can actually, just as in uh, the slicing, pass a third number. And this third number is the step size. So again, um, we'll start at 2, go up to 5, but take steps of 2. Um, yeah, I'll execute this now. And you can see here this goes from 0 to 5. Then it goes from 2 to 5 because we started 2 and go up to 6, minus 1. And then here we started 2, go up to 5, but take steps of 2. So it says 2 and 4. And uh, now we have this uh, additional print here, which comes from this print afterwards, i. Um, and this is just to show you that even after leaving the scope of this for loop, we can still access this variable i. And this variable i was created inside the for loop. And after execution of the whole for loop, it will have the last value um, that was used in the for loop, in this case, 4. So here, um, 4 was the last one that was printed inside this loop. And um, yeah, we'll still have 4 uh, in the end. This will not go like any further up, and this will also not get removed after the loop. Um, yeah, and this is just uh, this last line here is just to show you again that this range, um, this range class, does actually have uh, this iter function, meaning that um, it's an iterable and we can use it in the uh, in the for loop as we've seen already. Okay, um, now a very useful function um, that we can use to have basically the for each loop where we iterate over a collection but also get an index for each element is the enumerate function. And enumerate um, can be used simili similarly as range, but um, enumerate will not get um, a maximum index, but will uh, take a collection. And here we first uh, define the collection grades and uh, put some strings into that. And then we iterate um, over these grades, but we first call enumerate has grades and use that as the um, iterator we want to iterate over. And note here that now we have two variables that we create from that, um, namely an i and the grade. And this will, um, Python will already figure that out itself because enumerate will always return two um, values for each um, iteration of the loop. And the first one will be assigned to the i and the second one will be assigned to grade. And enumerate will always first return an index and then um, the element of the certain collection that was passed. And then we just print um, the index plus one. So enumerate will start counting from zero. And uh, if we add one, we'll just start from one. So it's an index shift. And um, then we'll also print the grade that was returned in the loop. And here we can see we get the indices, uh, not actually the indices, but uh, indices plus one. So one to six, uh, which you could see as numerical grades, and then actually the the text of the grade. But um, yeah, be careful with um, iterating over um, these these collections, because if you iterate just over a collection, 
it will uh, convert that to iterator and changing these values inside an iterator will not change them in the collection. So here in this loop, when just iterating over the grades and um, storing each current element from grades in the variable i, um, we want to modify the outstanding grade. For that, we have to check um, if the current uh, grade i is equal to outstanding. Um, then it will go into this if block. We'll first print that it did reach it so that we know afterwards that we got to outstanding and that we can do something here. And then we'll try to uh, set this value. So we'll try to say i equals not so good after all. And the intention would be that we want to change the collection itself and not um, just the value inside the loop. But if we execute this and print grades at the end, we still have outstanding and we don't see not so good after all anywhere in this list. So be careful with that. Um, changing these variables inside loops will not change the collection they were generated from. Um, but as you can see, we did actually reach this. So um, it did execute this code. Um, yeah, if you want to change the elements of a collection, then you will have to use um, basically a normal um, index style for loop with a range. And um, if you want to iterate over the indices of a collection, you can use range and then pass len of this collection. And this will make sure that um, your indices start at zero and then go up to the maximum index in your collection. Since len of a collection returns the length, um, the number of elements in this collection range of len of grades um, will generate indices from zero to the last index in grades. And here we save the index in i, and then we check if um, the current element that we're looking at is outstanding by saying grades at the index i, because now we're iterating over indices. We have to check grades um, at the index i if that is outstanding. And if it's outstanding, um, we go into this true, if this, into this if block, and we'll say, um, again, the collection grades at the position i equals not so good after all. And now if we print grades after that, we can see that it actually changed outstanding to not so good after all. Um, all right, yeah, so um, in Java and C++, another thing you can do with these indices is modify the index itself inside the loop and it will affect further iterations. This also um, does not work directly in Python. If you want this behavior, you should use a while loop with a counter. And then as the condition in the while loop, you should have um, something like counter less than um, some limit. So like counter uh, smaller than 10, for example. And um, then you can also modify the index inside the while loop. And you of course have to uh, increase the uh, counter inside the while loop by some step size every iteration. So somewhere in your while um, block, you should have something like counter plus equals one or some other step size. And um, this example here shows you that um, we can't we can change the index inside of, uh, inside this block, but it will not affect our, uh, further um, iterations of the loop. If we run this, um, this loop iterates from zero to nine, and we'll always print the index i, then add three to this index i and then print it again. And uh, from these 10 prints, you can see that it starts with the, uh, zero and after adding three, we get three. But then in the next iteration, it will go to one. So this adding three to the index didn't affect any, um, any of the coming iterations, but it just um, changed this i variable inside this block. So yeah, keep, uh, keep that in mind and um, yeah. I hope that was a, um, enough of an introduction into the control flow in Python. And um, yeah, make sure to um, look out for the generator concept in next week's lecture.